This is a bit of a different type of video to the usual ones I make, but before I even get into that, if you could drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel, I'm trying to hit 20k as soon as possible, so doing all of those things really helps out a lot and it would be greatly appreciated. Anyways, back to the video. So it's a bit different and I thought I'd just talk about some of the lies and narratives that have been talked about Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving and this Brooklyn Nets team just over the last couple of years since they've been formed. Now I did come up with this idea about a month ago and I'd written down quite a lot of things. Now things have changed since then. Clearly the NBA is completely different and Kevin Durant and Kyrie are back on the floor. So there's been some big changes and the narrative has kind of switched a little bit. But at the same time, there's still a lot of things that are being said about these two players as a pair and the Nets as a team that I just don't think are fair or true in the slightest. And that's why I thought I'd make a video on those exact things. And there's no better place to start than with chemistry. That's something that's been questioned over the last year and a half non-stop. Everyone's talked about can Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving coexist with all these other Nets players? Can it work? Do these players have what it takes to coexist? Because there's been a lot of things said about Kyrie and Kevin Durant in particular. And I don't think most of it's fair because you look at the things KD's done. He didn't have any problems with teammates or being a diva or any of those things in OKC. He comes to Golden State and throughout most of his career there, there was not really any issues. The main things he's got in trouble with or like people have kind of called him out for is mainly clapping back at fans and reporters. And last time I checked, that doesn't matter because that's got nothing to do with the locker room. So he can continue doing that. He can continue making burner accounts, which people want to laugh at and criticize him for. But that's got nothing to do with his chemistry on the court or off the court with his teammates. That's a completely different story. And there's only been a couple of incidents. The major one was the one with Draymond Green. And I think Draymond's an exceptional player. But at the same time, it was KD asking for the ball in a clutch time situation and Draymond wouldn't give it to him. I mean, I'd be kind of upset as well if I'm one of the best scorers in NBA history, and you've got someone who's not a good scorer. Draymond does a lot of good things, but he's not a good scorer. That's not one of them, and he's refusing to give me the ball. Yeah, I'd be kind of upset. I think that's pretty reasonable, and that's probably the major thing that's really been on-court and led to off-court chemistry issues, just that incident. I haven't really heard anything else about KD. Again, the burner accounts, that's cool and all, that's funny to laugh at, but it doesn't mean anything about what they're going to do as a team and those teammates. In terms of KD, this thing about him being a diva, his ego, his chemistry, complete lies. If you can back it up with something factual, apart from that on-court argument that he had with Draymond, like I mentioned, then go ahead and prove me wrong. But until then, I'm just going to see him as a perfectly fine teammate because nothing else really suggests otherwise. And in terms of Kyrie, up until his point in Boston, he was never seen as a bad teammate. There was never any issues about him. Sure, he was a bit out there. He made some bold statements. It's kind of like KD as well. They've said some things that have gone against the grain and people probably haven't particularly liked, the media in particular, and it's led them to cast those two as villains, those two as bad people, bad teammates, all of those things. What has Kyrie done particularly that's been suggesting of a bad teammate? The time in Boston. But let's give it some context. His grandma passed away during his time in Boston just before the playoffs, and he mentioned it on a podcast, which I listened to with my very own ears, and what he said was basically... He didn't feel like talking to the media, that's why he was giving such dull responses, and it did affect some of the on-court and off-court relationships with his teammates because he just wasn't in the right headspace, and you've got to kind of give him a pass for that because up until then, he'd never seemed to struggle in the playoffs, he'd never seemed to be a bad leader, a bad person, any of these things, and he just had a bad series against the Bucks and was just in a bad head state. I think you can give him a pass for that. You look at guys like Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, they talk glowingly of him, so I don't think he can be that bad of a teammate. So this chemistry thing, the idea that these two aren't going to work together or more importantly, work with other people, I think it's just lies. I don't think there's anything else to back it up apart from a few off-court things that they've said that have kind of been head-scratching and a couple of incidents. That's it. Let's move on from that. We've talked about chemistry enough. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Personally, I just don't see it. I think it's just people trying to cause a stir, people trying to find that next story. But anyways, let's move on to the actual team and some of the lies that have been said about the team, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, all of those things. Now, one of my favorite things was before KD had even stepped back on the court. Now, we've seen him now, and people have really changed their opinion on what he can do coming back from injury because... They've seen him on the floor and shock horror, the guy who's seven foot can move like a gazelle, can cross over, can hit pull-up shots, can hit pull-up threes, pull-up mid-ranges shots, can get to the rim, can do everything offensively. 
he's actually pretty good even after an injury. Now we yet to see just how much it affects him because when it comes to the NBA Finals, when it comes to the NBA Playoffs, it's going to be a different story to going up against the Wizards and the Celtics in preseason. But if you just base it off his offensive flow, just how good he looks, do I see any issues? Not currently. He looks fantastic and... Again, this goes back to a point that I make pretty much every video, and I'm probably sick of saying it, you're probably sick of hearing it. Can we give these guys a chance before we try to make these assessments? People had written him off. I heard so many people say, oh, if he can get back to 80%, that'll be great. Can he get back to 100% and then we can kind of start ticking it down? Oh, he can't get back to 100, maybe 95, 90, 85. There we go. Let's keep ticking it down. Let's see what he can actually do on the court before we try to give him the lowest possible expectations. I know that's people trying to be reasonable, but at the same time, I don't think it's reasonable to assume how someone's going to perform based off past experiences when these are completely different situations, different medical crews, different players, different body types different scenarios. It's just completely different. I know you can look at it as a test and probably kind of make an assumption based off that, and that's perfectly fine. But at the same time, to just put a ceiling on him straight away without getting to see him back on the court, like... It's just another thing that people love to do, which just irks me a lot. And I think Kevin Durant looks as good as ever, possibly as good as ever. Offensively, at the very least, he looks fantastic. Let's talk about Kyrie as well. He's had injury problems, and he's had problems over whether he can affect his team in a winning way. Again, this leads back to his one time in Boston. This is something that annoys me so much. This whole narrative, Kyrie is a negative effect on his team when he's a top 15 player in the league and has been for quite some time. And basically, let me just lay out the narrative for you. This is why apparently Kyrie is a bad teammate and doesn't help his team contribute to win. So Kyrie gets injured and the Boston Celtics obviously make the Eastern Conference Finals. Now they play different teams, different rosters, different players on their teams have different performances. The next year, Kyrie comes back and as I said, his grandma passed away. He clearly wasn't in a good headspace and he didn't perform well. But at the same time, they played a different team. They had a different roster. Different players on their team had different performances to the last year. There's no constant variables. When you do a science experiment, when you do experiments, you got to look for constant variables. If you want to prove someone is a bad effect on his team, then I've got to look at Jason Tatum. I've got to look at all these guys averaging the exact same points a game, doing the exact same things from last year, going up against the exact same players and Kyrie filling in. And we just can't do that, can we? That's completely unreasonable, isn't it? To expect that you could do that. That's just unreasonable. It can't happen. Yeah, I know, it can't. It's also unreasonable to say Kyrie doesn't help his team win games because they had a good run without him going up against different teams to the next year and he had a bad stretch of games because of a personal circumstance. That's probably unfair as well, wouldn't you say? I'd say that's kind of unfair and I'd say he's done enough to suggest he actually helps his team win games. I've seen it in the NBA Finals. That counts for something. That's all I'm going to say. So that's just a bunch of lies as well. That's probably the biggest lie from this whole thing. If you want to take one thing out of it, the fact that people say Kyrie Irving doesn't contribute to wins because of that circumstance, one of the worst lies and one of the worst narratives possible. But another thing people have questioned, can Kyrie and Kevin Durant coexist on the floor together apart from just their chemistry issues? Well, yeah, they're great shooters. Kyrie's a fantastic off-ball player. So is KD. He's learned to be an off-ball player in Golden State. People forget this. He played off-ball a lot of the time in Golden State. He was an underrated playmaker, giving you six assists a game. Kyrie is probably one of the top 10 playmakers in the entire NBA. One of the most underrated three-point shooters over the course of his career. People talk about Damian Lillard, all those guys. Well, Kyrie's been consistently at 40% throughout his career. Put some respect on his name as a shooter, as an off-ball player, as all of those things. He's not just a ball hog. He's not just someone who has the ball in his hands a lot. And the fact of the matter, Kyrie is no ball hog. And I would actually say among elite guards, he's probably one of the better off-ball players in the entire NBA. So a lie. Again, just another lie. So many of them to cover this video. And that's another one of my favorites because it's another terrible one. Now, am I going to sit here and tell you that the Nets are absolutely foolproof? They're going to be fantastic. They're going to win the NBA finals. KD and Kyrie are going to lead their team. There's going to be absolutely no bumps in the road. No. Now the team as a whole, what do I think of it? I think the Nets are going to be good. I think there's this narrative as well. Another narrative that they're just going to be a bad defensive team and that's going to lead to them being terrible. No, that's not quite the case. When you look at NBA champions over the last decade, yes, you've got to be a top 10 defensive team in the NBA. That's exactly what the Nets were during last year's regular season. They were the 10th best defensive team in the league. They bring in KD, who's an above average defender. Kyrie's an okay defender at the guard position. Not much different to who they had before and what they were working with before. It's all about buying into the system. One thing when you look at this Nets team that I could compare to other teams like the Blazers, the Nuggets, they don't have any liabilities on defense. 
They might not have any really good defenders, and they might not have an Anthony Davis anchoring that defense, leading to them being one of the best defenses in the league. But when I look at teams over the last decade that have won championships, you've either got to have a top offense or a top defense. So if they can be a good above average defense as well, which just comes to them buying in, in my opinion, because like I said, they've got a number of veteran guys who are smart team defenders. And if they all play the right role, it could lead to them being a pretty good defensive team. So I think there's no real issues there. Sure, they're not going to stop LeBron and AD. That's the thing that everyone always comes back to. Who's going to stop LeBron and AD? No one in the entire NBA is going to do that. That's not how the game of basketball is played. And I'm sick of that being a narrative as well. I'm just fed up of everything at this point in time. But I'm just sick sick of that as well. They can't stop AD and LeBron, so they're obviously going to lose. Yeah, well, I mean, no one's going to be able to stop AD and LeBron, so with that in mind, the Lakers are going to win the next 15 championships. And so they probably will, because they've got the best team in the NBA, but at the same time, it comes down to role players, and that's what it came down to for the Lakers. AD and LeBron were fantastic, sublime, superb, all of those things, but at the same time, guys like Rondo, Caruso, KCP all stepped up when they needed to, and that's what helped the Lakers get over the line, and the same thing's going to be for the Brooklyn Nets if they want to win a championship. It's not about them one-on-one -on -one defensively against two of the most unstoppable offensive players in NBA history. No. It's not that simple. It's more about them as a team defense buying in and playing their roles. That's what's going to lead to them being a good enough defense to win games against those kind of teams. Do I think the Nets are favorites to win a championship? No. Do I think all of these things said about them are complete lies and they're going to be a good team with a number of assets that make them a really dangerous team to go against, particularly if KD and Kyrie stay healthy? Yes. And I think it's very, very unfair for people to assassinate their character based off a couple of incidents. Like, we don't know the half about what they are as players, what they are as teammates. We've seen this recently with Kawhi and Paul George. No one really thought those guys were divas, and it turns out they're doing all of the things that were mentioned. I mean, we don't know anything. So when it comes down to it, we don't know if KD and Kyrie are the best teammates in NBA history or they're terrible guys. But at the same time, I've got nothing to suggest they're terrible guys. And until I do have something to suggest otherwise, I'm going to continue to believe the optimistic way and continue to believe that they're good people and good teammates. And with that in mind, that's pretty much all I've got to say. It was a bit of a ramble and it was a bit messy, but you get the points I'm making. A lot of these things are lies just made up by the media, the narratives that start to form and then people can't break them off. It's what happens. They form a narrative and then it's unbreakable. When in reality, what does that narrative even start from? Normally just from nothing. Now, if you did enjoy the video, a like would be greatly appreciated. Subbing to the channel helps as well. Other than that, I'll catch you next time. Bye.